Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian from the Association of the United States Army's Annual Conference and Trade Show in Washington, D.C. And we've got with us Major General Dave Bassett, who is the Program Executive Officer for Ground Combat Systems. Sir, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Good afternoon, Vaga. Um, so a uh, lot of uh, programs on your plate, a uh, lot of activity going on. You've got some priority efforts going on, but one of the biggest one is obviously the armored uh, uh, multi-purpose uh, vehicle, the AMPV program, which was a uh, little bit contested the last time uh, that we talked. Uh, the vehicle is under contract. BAE Systems is, is working hard on it. Uh, we were down there and we talked to Mark uh, Signorelli a little bit about the program. Um, you know, bring us up to speed from your perspective on, you know, how you gauge the progress of that program. So, so AMPV is really through its design phase at this point. Uh, we got through our critical design review here over the summer. Uh, and now it's it's full scale trying to build prototypes. And the first one of the first prototypes has been uh, uh, BA brought with them uh, to AUSA this year, and they and have a it good looking the prototype. It is. It's a, a medical evacuation vehicle, uh, one of the five uh, variants of AMPV. And really, where the program's at now is is now that we're through design, we're into build. Uh, we're going to go into a prototype testing uh, starting early next year, and uh, we'll be in testing for some time. And what we're trying to do is to position that program uh, so that should there be urgent needs arise uh, to replace the 113 in our Armored Brigade Combat Team formations, uh, we're positioned to do that. Uh, and one thing we do know for sure uh, is that the 113 is really at the end of its life cycle. And uh, we're pretty confident that the AMPV, even with some growing pains, is a significantly better capability uh, than the vehicle that it replaces. One of the um, uh, points that people make about it is a concern about concurrency, and you and I talked a little bit about this before we got started, and so I want you to, to try to address that. There, you know, uh, whether you're a defense acquisition university or elsewhere, you know, the mantra is learn from the joint strike fighter, don't concurrently develop and produce at the same time. And that is, and folks say that, well, you know, that's a challenge on the program. You know, is it a challenge on the program at all from your standpoint? I, I don't see it as a problem for AMPV. Uh, I think when you deal with concurrency, the most dangerous kind of concurrency is when you're developing technology at the same time you're trying to integrate that technology into your platforms. And AMPV is really based off uh, common, off-the-shelf kind of technology that's already been developed. So we don't have that kind of uh, concurrency. Uh, in any given program, we got to design it, we got to build it, and we got to test it. And so depending on uh, if, we, if we were to schedule those things heel to toe, well, we end up in a very long program schedule. Uh, and, and so there's really no interest in those kind of extended acquisition timelines. Uh, instead, what we've done is we've overlapped them enough uh, so that we feel like we're moving the program forward and we're managing the risk of the concurrency of, say, design, build, and test. Uh, and the risk, as we talk about it, is if we uh, go and build a few vehicles before the design is completely stable, we have to be prepared to go retrofit them or adjust them in light of test results. And that's exactly the kind of, I'd say, good concurrency that you have a, on a program like AMPV, or for that matter, a program like uh, the strike lethality vehicle that we're delivering for the 2nd Cavalry Regiment in Europe. Well, so speaking about um, that program, um, are you happy with its progress? I think that we've done exceptionally well moving that forward. Uh, there's, there's always a desire to move very, very quickly in a program like that. And I think we were very successful in that program, really clearing the bureaucracy out of the way. And so we were left with a timeline, which was really about getting the design stable, uh, building those strike lethality vehicles. And I've been down both in Anniston uh, as well as uh, in Sterling Heights, where they're building those vehicles today. Uh, and we're going to deliver the first strike of lethality vehicle into test, uh, at least into contractor test, by the end of October, which is, is an amazing uh, uh, performance by General Dynamics, along with their subs, uh, Kongsberg and others, who've worked together to bring that together. Uh, and we've cleared, like I said, we've cleared the bureaucracy largely out of the way on a program like that. What were some of the key bureaucratic elements that you pushed out of the way to get this forward? So I, I think the... the, the, the there were two things, really. The first was that Congress was willing to fund, in the very first year, virtually the entire budget necessary uh, to execute that program. So as we approach uh, FY17, and there are some programs that will struggle with impacts from the continuing resolution, strike lethality isn't one of them, because those dollars were appropriated uh, in FY16. Uh, and so we won't be held up by money on this program. Uh, I think the other area that is that we, we uh, were able to coordinate executing that as an engineering change to the existing striker platform. And by doing that, we did not have the formal milestone review process, but what we did do was retain uh, the, the really good common sense 
uh, best practices of active position management to make sure that we had a stable design, that we tested out that stable design before we ramped up full rate production. And there were some uh, early on in that program that really wanted even more concurrency. And I think what we ended up with was a schedule that we're going to stick to. Uh, we've been able to deliver some savings already, and we're going to deliver more than the unit asked for. Are, are you, um, you, you mentioned that the continuing resolution will not be inf affecting uh, that program. Right. But do you have any concerns about continuing resolution and how it's going to affect the rest of a very vast portfolio? Uh, so the one area where I do worry about uh, the continuing resolution is potentially impacting on our new howitzer on the, the M109A7. Uh, continuing resolutions are, are most challenging where you have an increase in production, and the plan right now is to, to achieve full rate production on the howitzer in early 17. So if the continuing resolution stretches beyond about March, we could have an impact to the howitzer as a result of that. Uh, the howitzer is out at uh, uh, Fort Hood right now in its initial operating test. Uh, and, and we're absolutely focused on making that production decision based on the performance of that platform. Uh, the PIM is, is an interesting mix of capabilities because it's a new uh, automotive infrastructure that's going to be common with Bradley and, and uh, the AMPV. So we have that 85% commonality across our armor brigade combat team formations. Uh, and it's a legacy gun. And so I think looking forward, we'll be looking at addressing uh, the limitations of that gun and extending its range as we look to uh, improve the performance of the howitzer even beyond PIM. Are you going to, are you interested in the long, I mean, there's always been a debate about a far longer tube than, than the current tube. Um, what's the thinking on that? Yeah, so there's some S&T investments that are looking at exactly that. Uh, and uh, we're also working with uh, the STO office, uh, the SCO office, I'm sorry. Uh, strategic, strategic Capabilities, capabilities Office. Uh, on, on some options that might uh, really expand the operational use of the Paladin House. What about on the ammunition side? I mean, do you think, uh, you know, we, we talked to Dr. Roper, talked to reporters some weeks ago, and it was a fascinating thing about how to sort of inject technology and give greater capability. One of the, the, the questions, obviously, was different kinds of rounds, certainly on the Navy side. Uh, there was discussion on that. But what are you guys thinking when it comes to ammunition to augment the firepower of existing systems? Well, we've got some, some ammunition uh, improvements coming in the very near future that we think are going to make a big difference. Uh, so the, the low-cost GPS guidance system uh, for the howitzer, um, and I'm drawing a blank right now on the acronym. You'd think I know all the acronyms. Uh, but that's, that's all right. You're keeping track of a lot of other uh, stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just on the, on the horizon there. And, uh, and, and working with Dr. Roper's office on some really advanced munitions that I'll leave it to him to discuss that uh, may very broadly expand the utility of the howitzer. And for us, it's about making sure that the platform is uh, integrating those capabilities to handle it. Uh, and so, you know, what's the, what kind of capabilities can you get with current tube? What can you get with, say, a larger tube, uh, both from a range and a lethality standpoint? When you look, speaking of lethality, um, you know, the Russians have demonstrated some incredible capabilities, whether you talk to General Hodges uh, or any of the other commanders in Europe, U.S. or, or, or European. You know, there was a lot of respect for the kind of firepower the Russians are able to unleash, and, and precise firepower in, in, in some cases. You know, as the PEO, ground combat system, you know, what, what do you draw as a career army officer, but also an acquisition professional, of the capabilities they're fielding and some of the things the U.S. has to field in response? So I, I think we're learning a lot of lessons from watching uh, uh, how the Russians are operating, uh, both in the Ukraine, uh, as well as now in Syria. And we're doing our best to, to, to understand how they fight and how we may be able to equip uh, to, to counterbalance that. I mean, go, you go back historically, uh, the, the Soviet threat always had uh, outnumbered us in terms of uh, certain capabilities. And so if you go all the way back to uh, the, the airland battle doctrine, we had to be able to fight outnumbered and win. And uh, today it's really not that different in terms of the, the sort of the depth of their capabilities in Europe. And so what we have to do is be able to fight a whole lot smarter. Uh, and as we look at being able to apply uh, precision tech, uh, technologies, extending the range of our weapon systems. So if you look at the upgrades to Bradley and Abrams, uh, particularly in the next generation of upgrades, uh, improving uh, the, the ability to see at night going from second gen FLIR to third gen FLIR, uh, it gives us that standoff. Because we know we have to be able to uh, not just detect, but also identify at range. And we think maybe some of our adversaries are able to fire, even if with just being able to detect targets. And so third gen FLIR should give us that overmatch and begin to restore that. Because what we have to counterbalance is not just uh, 
not just the fact that they have those capabilities, but the proliferation of technologies. And so a lot of that advantage goes back to being able to fight as an integrated combined arms team and uh, the great training uh, that we get out of our soldiers. Um, does that also mean changes for the MLRS force as well? I'm not sure I can talk to MLRS. I, I know that, that uh, we have to look across the board on both tube uh, and MLRS artillery. And, and so for a long time, we had an advantage in one area, and maybe we recognized that our tube artillery didn't have quite the range uh, that our adversaries had. And so we're trying to, to look at both ends of that spectrum. Let's go to mobile protected uh, firepower. Um, there are two displays here already for old timers. The uh, armored gun system is greeting everybody when, when they uh, come in. Uh, that, uh, that program ended up being canceled a, a long time ago. And then General Dynamics, uh, you know, did uh, take five months to build an altogether new vehicle. Talk to us about what you want out of mobile protected firepower. Obviously, these are efforts by the companies to sort of shape the requirements, shape the future, and, and to position themselves. But as you look at it, you know, what, what are the essentials that this vehicle has to develop, deliver? Uh, so, so, you know, just first principles, uh, mobile protected firepower uh, is about adding uh, that protected firepower capability to our infantry brigade combat teams. And so you're going into a formation that doesn't have tanks, that doesn't have Bradleys. Uh, and, and so we got to have a system that's light enough and mobile enough to keep pace with our infantry and yet provides both the protection and firepower we're looking for. And so we've laid out an initial set of requirements that, uh, that General Milley, the chief, and all the four stars have uh, kind of gotten behind. And so as part of our strategy, we're really looking for two things. We're looking for feedback from industry on, on what set of vehicles and capabilities they can bring to bear against that set of requirements, and also to understand how, if those requirements were adjusted, how that might give us different options that maybe we didn't consider. And I think... Uh, uh, the work that BAE and General Dynamics have done to kind of show the art of the possible from two different parts of, say, that requirement is really valuable to our senior leaders to begin to understand what might be delivered within that requirements trade space. And so the second thing that we're really hoping we can do is as we lock in on those requirements, it's about letting industry use their own uh, innovation to prepare for a competition when the meaningful resources for mobile protected firepower uh, emerge in the budget in about FY18. And so that gives them about 18 months uh, to prepare their designs and to prepare a proposal that allows us to, as you go back to this discussion previously about concurrency, allows us to go after a program schedule that will be much more accelerated because they've got to come to the game day one with a mature, capable vehicle design that, that, that shows that we can execute it within the number of months that are available in an, in an accelerated program. Have you got like a weight limit on them, for example, or a gun tube that you want? Or, you know, what, what are some of the hard parts of it that, that you've already shaped as you try to sketch in the whole broader picture? Sure. So, so we had an industry day activity back in, I want to say, early September. It may have been in August. Time kind of flies this time of year. Uh, but we had gone out and laid out the basic requirements that were uh, approved by the chief at the AROC. And so that was a, a, a weight limit of 32 tons. That was uh, a a set of targets that require uh, a cannon solution of at least 50 millimeters up to about 120. Uh, but, but I'll tell you, it doesn't, our, our discussion with industry about requirements shouldn't stop there. It really ought to be about them taking that in, looking at the art of the possible. We do believe that in order to meet the timelines we've laid out, that a, a brand new vehicle start is probably not going to be feasible. And so they're going to have to take something uh, existing, whether it's in the case of BAE, they're showing you the uh, M8 out front, so they'd start with that as their point of departure. In the case of General Dynamics, they've started with an Ascod Ajax chassis and with some, some elements of the Abrams tank, which would allow for some commonality that's very important to us. Uh, and so they've got to be able to take an existing vehicle, modify it to meet that set of requirements, and have it ready to go. And, and I will tell you, I'm really enthusiastic about uh, a program strategy that would allow us to take two vehicles into the next engineering, manufacturing, and development phase, and not just one. And sometimes as resources get constrained, we get limited to, say, a single vendor. And uh, the Marine Corps, I think, has used multiple vendors very effectively in their ACV competition. And uh, we'd like to, to, to be able to benefit much in the same way an MPF to be able to carry two vendors uh, so that we don't have all of our eggs in one basket. Do, um, uh, 
I, I remember 20-something uh, years ago covering the uh, uh, XM8 program, but um, that also had Bradley componentry, right? Didn't have a Bradley power pack or something like that that, that had a degree of commonality? It may have. I, honestly, I don't know. What I can tell you, though, is that BA's got some work to do on the M8. Uh, it's got uh, electronics, which have long since gone obsolete since the early 90s. It's got a power pack that they couldn't source today. And so there's a substantial amount of engineering work that they have to do to get ready. And so I think you'll see as I talk about future programs, uh, I don't want to be a victim of the bureaucracy of the acquisition process. I want program managers that can look at the process, tailor it to fit the needs of their program, and then focus on the activities, design, build, test, and field, rather than the bureaucracy that they have to navigate. That's always going to be there in some shape or form. Good program managers find a way to get around it. Uh, and, and leadership that empowers them to actually make decisions. Um, active protection is something that the U.S. Army has been talking about for a very, very long time. Obviously, on the passive side, there's been a lot of investment, uh, both from very, very simple, but also reactive, you know, a whole, whole suite of technologies uh, on that. But, you know, what do you want to achieve in active protection, and what's the roadmap to get there? The Israelis have systems that have been fielded and have been demonstrated, uh, but there are a number of other folks who are, who are interested in sort of addressing that, scratching that itch. What's the kind, you know, bring us up to speed on sort of the efforts to, to bring active protection to the U.S. Army. So up until about the last 12 months, the Army had a long-term strategy to build towards a modular active protection system uh, in partnership with our S&T community so that when we got to the end, we had a system that could evolve in the face of current threats. And that was a pace of investment and a pace of development uh, that would field somewhere in the early 20s. I think with the increased threats that we've seen and maybe some opportunities to look at off-the-shelf systems, uh, we've been asked and are executing a plan that is going to take three off-the-shelf systems. And then uh, we're not talking about fully integrating them into a combat platform. We're talking about installing them, characterizing them, tuning them uh, to those specific combat platforms and, and giving Army senior leaders uh, the ability to make a really informed decision about uh, the kinds of capabilities and performance those systems can deliver uh, and the cost of those systems and then what we can do sort of in the near term while we wait for the longer term modular plan to play out. Um, this is about an informed decision. I think there's folks that look at uh, the performance of a commercial system that they see overseas and there's an assumption that you can just sort of slap it on and it's good to go in day one. And that's just not the way these systems operate. I mean, you've got to tune the system to the profile of the vehicle itself, the, 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 the structure offers, the metal offers a certain radar picture that you have to take into account as you, uh, as you detect incoming threats. You're going to put those effectors in different places. You're going to have blind spots in different places. And so this, this rapid accelerated program that we're working in conjunction with TARDAC and a number of industry partners is going to allow us to do that on our three critical platforms, Abrams, Bradley, and Stryker, and then position the Army for some uh, decisions either to buy what we've installed and characterized or potentially to say, I like the performance of this system, but I'd like you to put it on that platform, or, or uh, even to say none of those perform to the degree that we'd like. We're going to wait for a, a, a more enhanced capability later. Um, we've talked about this before, uh, but I want to ask you again about it. Um, if you look at the M1 tank, uh, it's not a spring chicken. If you look at the Bradley, um, it's not a spring chicken. An enormous amount of innovation has gone into these vehicles to keep them updated, to keep them fresh, whether it's through new optics, new buses, uh, you know, suspension improvements, other sorts of things that have happened over, over time. Um, is it time to start thinking about a new tank, a new armored fighting vehicle? And if so, what are some of the foundational principles that need to shape both of those vehicles? So, you know, we, uh, over the course of the last, say, 10 years, we've had some stops and starts on replacement vehicles rather than upgrades. Uh, and and uh, there's clearly, we're recognizing that there are limits with these exi existing platforms. Uh, I would say more so on the Bradley side than the Abrams side. Uh, as we look ahead, we want to make sure that whatever we leap ahead to really gives us that leap ahead in capability more so than an upgrade to an existing platform can give us. And so when the Army made the decision to allow the GCD term, uh, program to end, uh, there was a shift of resources away from a single program to replace the Bradley towards a set of programs to upgrade the platforms we have in ways that we felt, in fact, we did a substantial amount of analysis on this, uh, that would give those combat platforms more combat power spread across the brigade than simply replacing the Bradley. 
And so it's really about how those platforms perform within the entire formation, uh, more so than just looking at a single platform and saying it has limits, we have to replace it to move on. And so uh, I think our, our, our vendors and our S&T partners have done a great job in showing us what the limits are uh, to what can you do with a Bradley, and then how much more do you get when you leap ahead to an existing or to an advanced platform. Uh, again, limited by budget. Uh, and, and so when you look at, at, at our plan in combat vehicles, uh, I would tell you that the plan I, we put in place is about making the most of the budget that I have. It's not about making the case for capabilities that we clearly need that are not resourced in my budget. And so as we keep adding things into the portfolio, in many cases, we're having to slow down modernization slower and slower and slower. So we could get to the point where we're only able to modernize uh, a, a, an armored brigade combat team every two years, uh, which, which again is, is not a very credible long-term modernization strategy. So in that budget environment, uh, trying to then shift to a new vehicle with the risk that you would accept as those other vehicles age gets very challenging. But uh, we're partnered with our, our warfighter community. We're looking for opportunities to when the appropriate time is to shift to that based on both the availability of the budget and the kinds of technologies that would allow us to have an advanced leap ahead. So there's some key technologies in development right now at the Tank and Automotive Research and Development Center as well as in uh, our RDEC at Picatinny that if we bring them to bear on a new vehicle or even in an upgrade could allow us to have a significant increase in capability whether that's advanced fire control systems at RDEC, uh, an advanced engine that TARDEC has under development, advanced suspension systems, protection systems. We want to make sure that if we're going to do a new vehicle, we want it to be a leap ahead that we can't achieve with an existing platform. Let me take you to power. Uh, as, our, as our time winds down, um, you know, General Motors has partnered with TARDEC uh, to produce a hybrid uh, uh, powered uh, truck that's going to go through extensive testing. Um, the Army has, you know, I, I started my career talking about vehicle power a long, long time ago uh, and innovative sort of things that can happen. That revolution is actually happening as, you know, the commercial industry develops, obviously, better power um, alternatives to the internal combustion engine. But as you look at military vehicles, do you see a roadmap? Do you see particularly attractive technologies? Do you see a revolution in combat vehicle power out there? And if so, how soon do we reach the point where we may want to take advantage of some of these technologies? I think there are some opportunities on the horizon. Uh, one of the good elements of having two vendors on the ground combat vehicle program was it gave us insight into both the conventional powertrain as well as a hybrid electric powertrain that was part of the BAE design. And so we got some data on, on that design and then what it might enable. Uh, one of the benefits of having sort of a hybrid electric power kind of plant, and there's other ways to get this kind of electric power on your platform as well, is that it gives you the kind of high power, uh, you know, multiple tens of kilowatts, hundreds of kilowatts of electric power that's necessary to power things like uh, electromagnetic armor uh, or uh, the laser systems that have gotten so much attention lately uh, for a counter UAS or a CRAM mission. And so as we're going to evolve to those kinds of capabilities, we have to have the ability to generate substantial amounts of electric power on the platform. Uh, I think absent the need for that electric power, um, the, the cost-benefit analysis and the, the platform integration trade-offs of hybrid electric may not be worth it on a combat vehicle, but for those systems where you need to, say, mount a high-energy laser or other things, uh, having uh, integrated starter generators or other technologies that they demonstrated on Stryker or a fully hybrid powertrain that generates that kind of electric power on board may become an advantage. But there's always a trade-off because you've got to have a place for the batteries uh, and, and the complexity associated with that system, and we got a, a glimpse into that on the GCV program. Talk to us a little bit about electromagnetic armor. Mm -hmm. um, it's still on the horizon right now. Uh, it's one of the great technologies that our, our research development communities are looking at uh, for ways to address certain specific threat sets. Uh, if I've learned anything about armor over the years is that we've got to address a pretty diverse set of threats to our platforms. And so uh, there's a lot of folks out there who say, you know, if you get something like an active protection system, you can remove all the conventional armor. Uh, I'm not sure that's the case. I mean, we're looking really hard, say, at Stryker, uh, what armor we can take off with, with an APS. Uh, same thing on Abrams or Bradley. Uh, they may not actually be net substantial net reductions in weight as a result of things like APS. Electromagnetic armor may give us something different. But it, these are hard problems. You've got to look at things like multi-hit. You've got to look at a whole different range of threats, whether it's medium caliber, uh, large caliber, uh, kinetic threats. Uh, ATGMs, RPGs, tandems, there's lots of threats out there 
And so we've got a diverse range of protection technologies today on our vehicles. And I suspect in the future we're going to have a similarly diverse set of things to address that uh, very uh, threat set. Uh, sir, thanks very, very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Always enjoy talking to you. Uh, thanks, Vago. Great to see you.